Okay, yeah. So um, as Edwin said, I'm Jacinta Del Hayes. I'm a lecturer at the University of Cape Town, and I'm going to be talking about um, galaxy evolution surveys that we are doing with the Meerkat telescope. Um, and in particular, I'll talk about the Laduma and the Mighty surveys. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the first people of both sites of the AKA and its precursors, including the Wadjuri Yanji people of Australia and the San and the Khoi people of Southern Africa. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, I also wanted to mention the Cosmic Savannah, which if you haven't heard of it yet, uh, you should. It's um, a podcast run by myself and my colleague Daniel Kunema from the SAAO. And it's uh, talking about professional uh, astronomy that's coming from the African continent or related to Africa. Um, and it's suitable for a public or professional audience. So um, head to our website or any of these podcasting apps if you want to have a listen. And wherever you see this, um, this uh, headphone symbol during my talk, um, that's uh, an episode where you can find more information about that topic if you're interested. So I can't resist giving a little plug every time I give a talk. Okay, so in more detail, what um, I'm going to be talking about is uh, extragalactic radio surveys, and in particular, um, what you can do with them. So you can study H1 and you can study continuum. And then uh, we'll be going through uh, a bit of update on the Laduma survey, and in particular, the source finding that we've been doing in Laduma. Um, a little bit about Mighty H1 and then Mighty Continuum. So where I'll be talking about uh, the discovery of some giant radio galaxies and the follow-up of those that we've been doing with Meerkat. Okay. So first of all, um, extragalactic surveys, you know, to un really understand a galaxy or, or galaxies as a whole, we really have to understand uh, we really need multi-wavelength surveys because the different components of a galaxy um, emit a different wavelength. So over in the X-rays, this is a really nice um, plot made by Luke Davies, who is a member of the Gamma team. Um, in the X-rays, you've got, you know, contributions from AGN. Then in the ultraviolet optical and near-infrared, you've got contributions from young and old stars. Then we've got molecules and in the... Um, in the far infrared, we have the emission of dust. Um, so in order to really understand all of these different components, you need to observe at different wavelengths. But missing from this plot, of course, is the longer wavelengths, so the radio. And uh, here they are. Um, now, often these the radio regime was left off these kind of um, SED plots like this because um, until very recently, so the last five to ten years, radio extragalactic surveys weren't as simultaneously sensitive and high resolution and wide field enough to be comparable with these other uh, multi-wavelength surveys. But now they finally are, and so we're able to match the sources in the optical and in the far infrared and in the radio, et cetera, um, and to really be able to understand uh, the whole spectrum of what's going on in different galaxies. So we are doing this, of course, with radio telescopes. The started off with single dish telescopes. So this is the part telescope that I uh, used for, during my PhD. And then they got bigger and bigger until we split them up into interferometers, such as the, the VLA, the very large array in the US. And now we have the new generation of um, SKA Pathfinder and Precursor telescopes, which of course we've got our very own Meerkat over in Australia, there's ASCAP. Um, leading up to the, the SKA eventually. Um, and there's some, some great interviews by uh, Director General Phil Dund and Chair of the Board Catherine Sazarski, um, if you're interested in learning more about those. All right, so we have a radio telescope. And then what do we see with the radio telescope? There are two kinds of emission that we can um, study. One is spectral line and the other is continuum. So basically you get both of them for free at the same time when you do uh, a radio survey of the sky. You can, you've basically got three axes here in the data cube. You've got right ascension, declination, and the third axis is frequency or equivalently um, velocity or redshift if we're talking about a particular emission line. And what we're often looking at um, with these spectral cubes is the 21 centimetre emission of neutral hydrogen gas, which we call H1. That's not the only emission line that appears at these wavelengths, 
Um, you can also get sometimes sneaking in there the OH uh, mission line of mega mazes. Um, and that's kind of starting to, well, you, you might say contaminate our sample if you're not interested in OH, but if you are interested in it, then, then we're able to detect that, which is getting exciting. And then if you squish down your third axis, your frequency axis, all into one pancake, you just end up with this 2D map of right ascension versus declination, which is the integral over all frequencies. And what you're looking at here is continuum emission from synchrotron radiation. So what um, emission mechanisms are releasing each of these things? So for the H1, we have um, the spin flip transition of hydrogen. So hydrogen has uh, like a spin quantum parameter and the proton, the spin of the proton and the spin of the electron can either be aligned or misaligned. And this misaligned state is lower energy. So when the, um, the hydrogen atom spontaneously flips from the aligned to the misaligned state, it releases a, a photon of energy uh, at 21 centimetres. And if we have a lot of this H1 gas rotating around a galaxy that's edge on to our line of sight, then we might end up with this nice little horn profile. So this is what the H1 spectrum would look like uh, of a galaxy, of a spiral galaxy. And we can integrate under this spectrum to get the H1 mass contained in that galaxy. Um, and this is important because cold hydrogen gas, so the H1, is the raw fuel for star formation. It uh, pulls even further down into H subscript 2, so molecular hydrogen gas, and then it, that's the site um, of star, stars forming. So you have a galaxy without any hydrogen gas. It basically, it's basically red and dead. It's not going to be able to form any new stars. Um, so we want to know whether um, the evolution of the amount of hydrogen gas in galaxies or in the universe has changed over cosmic time. And these points here are showing you how measurements of how that might have changed over cosmic time. But this gray line here um, is showing you that the star formation rate uh, density of galaxies has changed dramatically over time. And so why is this not trace in the H1? We want to understand that. Um, and H1 can also trace the interactions and the outskirts of galaxies. So here we have a beautiful image from the Mongoose survey, um, early science data, um, where in the background, you've got the optical image of a galaxy and in the red, you've got the H1. And you can see um, how, how much larger the galaxy is when you look in H1 and those outer layers are held onto le um, with, with less gravity, obviously, out of those greater distances. Um, and so they be very susceptible to um, the effects of, of interactions. And so we can understand um, a lot about galaxy evolution and how they change and how they're affected by studying this H1 21 centimeter line. Okay, so that was H1. And then what, uh, what actual physical sources are emitting continuum radiation? As I said, that's synchrotron radiation, which is relativistic particles spiraling uh, in a magnetic field and releasing this light. Um, now, you can have kind of two main sources of that emission. Uh, one is star-forming galaxies, where you have supernova explosions, which kick out, um, well, accelerate electrons too close to the speed of light. They interact with the magnetic field of the galaxy, and they, that forms synchrotron radiation. So, um, you know, the amount of stars that die in supernova can tell us if we assume an initial mass function, how many stars were formed, and therefore after some small time delay, um, the, the, this is implying uh, star formation in this galaxy. Um, and then the other source is AGN, so active galactic nuclei, which are galaxies with supermassive black holes in the centre, which are accreting matter and uh, heating up to enormous temperatures, releasing huge amounts of energy, um, accelerating electrons to relativistic speeds, which get caught up in the twisted magnetic fields near the black hole and can be funneled out in these large radio synchrotron jets that you can see here. So those are the two main kinds of um, continuum emission sources that we see. And of course, you can have hybrids. You can have a star forming galaxy that also hosts, hosts an AGM. Um, all right, so this will be focused on Meerkat, and I think to this order it doesn't really need much of an introduction, but of course it's our um, it's our SKA precursor here in South Africa in the Karoo, and it operates at L-band, UHF-band, and I believe now also at S-band. Um, 
and it mostly spends its time doing large survey projects, so LSPs, um, but there is also a limited amount of open time, and I believe the open time call is open at the moment. So if you want some of your own meerkat, get, uh, get writing your proposal. And this is the list of the LSPs, all of the, the surveys that, um, that Meerkat is doing. And what I'll be talking about today is two of them in particular. So Luma, which is uh, purely an H1 survey, and Mighty, which has both an H1 continuum, uh, H1 component and a continuum component. Okay, so first um, I'll say a little bit about Laduma. Uh, so Laduma is a narrow, deep H1 survey with Meerkat, um, and its aim is to be the deepest radio spectral emission line survey to date. So when we do uh, extra galactic surveys, we often use what we call this wedding cake approach, where some surveys are wide field covering a large area of the sky, but fairly shallow because you always have a trade-off uh, between sensitivities, uh, field of view, uh, and... Um, um, depth. Uh, and so an example of a, a wide field but shallow survey is Wallaby, uh, which is conducted with ASCAP over in Australia. Um, and this is over like basically the full sky um, out to lower redshifts, um, but hopefully we'll find some rarer objects. Uh, and then at the very end of the spectrum is Laduma, which is a single pointing um, field uh, and observed for a very long time to very high sensitivity and all the way out to redshifts of 1.4-ish. Um, so it's only a, a one square degree field, a single pointing of this particular field, which is called the um, Extended Chandra Deep South, so ECDFS here, which has a lot of multi-wavelength data already available in it, and that's why this particular field was chosen. Uh, so LADUMA stands for looking at the distant universe, Meerkat Array. Uh, and the PIs are Sarah Bluth from UCT, also Andrew Baker and Nahal Verda. Um, and this is going to have about up to 300 hours in the L band and about 3,000 hours at the lower frequencies in the U band. So that takes us out to redshift of about 1.4. So if we're, if we're looking at H1, we, as I said, get out to redshift of about 1.4. Um, but if we're considering OH mega mazes, we can take them out to even further, about 1.8 or so. We expect when the full survey is done that we'll be able to detect about 3,000 um, direct H1 emission detections. Um, the symbol of Laduma is this Vuvuzela um, because it, it represents the shape of uh, the cosmic volume we're probing as we go out to higher redshifts. And uh, I believe Laduma is, is what is shouted also um, at these at these these games uh, and it means it thunders. Okay, this is a slide from Sarah Blythe, uh, just talking about a few different science goals of Laduma. So we, we basically want to understand what's going on with the hydrogen content of galaxies in different cosmic epochs or with redshift and in just different environments. So we want to know things like can uh, what, what's going on with the H1 mass function, so the, the number of uh, galaxies per unit volume, um, of different masses and does this evolve over time? Does this evolve over environment? What about the total cosmic H1 density of the whole universe? That evolving with redshift? Um, how do the H1 masses of galaxies compare with their the, the, the mass from their stars? Um, and uh, also what's going on with the Tully fissilation? Do these things evolve? Um, and then as a bonus question, how common are OH mega mazes? as a function of redshift. So OH mega mazes are thought to, to be kind of triggered during, during collisions of galaxies. So what's the current status of LADUMA? So about um, 300 hours of L-band data has been taken. I believe this is all of it or almost all of it, but don't quite quote me on that one. Um, and about 500, 600 hours of UHF band data. Um, this has been data processed by the excellent pipeline working group of LADUMA using uh, process, the Process Meerkat pipeline and some custom script uh, on Elihu. And they have prepared this DR1 uh, L-band data cube that you can see here. This is actually not a slightly older version of it, but it will give you an idea. Every now and again, you can see a few little white dots popping up and those are the sources. 
depending on how good your screen is and how well your data is holding up during load shedding. Um, okay, so this is soon to be released to the team and uh, the public release is expected by the end of this year. Um, so this is using the first 127 hours that collected in L band and goes out to 34 megahertz. So that takes us out to a redshift of 0.08. Okay, so this is the low redshift uh, component that we're talking about now. And then we have, uh, sorry, this is all taken in 32K mode. So this is the high spectral resolution, which is then smoothed down to 8K during data processing. And we are reaching a nice sensitivity of about uh, 0.1 millijanskis per beam per channel. All right, so then once we've got a cube, the next thing we have to do is go and find the sources in the field. So this is the work of the Source Finding Working Group, which is led by myself and Lundu March and Gwabachki. Um, and we've taken three main source finding strategies. So the first is visual source finding, which is done fully manually. And this is coordinated by a margin. Then we have this match filtering technique with code that is semi-automated. Um, so it kind of does some automatic source finding and we require um, visual checks. So we have to look at each of the galaxies in order to reject false detections. Uh, this is written and um, formed by Ed Elson from the University of the Western Cape. And then we have SOFIA 2, which is an automated source finding code um, that's uh, developed uh, for international use and um, use of the, oops, sorry, not the next talk. Um, this is master's project of uh, Leia Stockenstrom, who's done a wonderful job of implementing SOFIA already onto um, Laduma. Um, okay, so just going through a couple of um, our processes. So this is most of our visual source finding is done. So we load the data cube into Carter, um, which is uh, hosted on a Leafu. And then we look through the different spectral channels and sometimes we see a detection. And if we do, we put a little box around it, a little region. You can see that the regions are listed here and we can change the name to the frequency that it, occur that it occurs at. Then we can export this region list and convert it to a catalog. Um, so that's how the visual source finding has been done. And usually about three different people do the source finding and, and then we pair it together. We're also starting to use VR, so virtual reality, this iDavi system um, that, that is uh, mainly being implemented here in the Viz Lab at UCT. Um, and you can see here, this is Marchin going in the data cube and looking around. You can see these bright dots. They are the, um, the galaxies in the cube. Okay, this is freezing up a little bit, probably because of the data. But you can see you can, you can select one of the galaxies. You can zoom into it uh, and you can uh, find out different pieces of information about it, which is really neat. Okay, this is a bit jumpy, but you get the general idea. So that, so we're going to be focusing a little bit more on examining the galaxies that we've already found in VR, which is really nice. Uh, and this is the OH Mega Maze that we've, uh, one, one of these were found uh, by I, by Marchin uh, earlier, I think it was last year. Um, so this is hydroxyl, so OH, and it's at a redshift of 0.52, which is quite high redshift. This is the optical image of what it looks like. And these contours are the uh, sort of the eight, well, what we thought was H1, but it turns out to be um, uh, this, the emission line of OH, and you can see, Here's what the spectral line looks like in the Luduma data. Um, so it was found visually with only one track, so only one night of observations with Meerkat, which is quite remarkable, and that was published by March and last year, and it's got the nickname of Nkalakata, which is, uh, means big boss in Isizulu. You can see that March has been looking at that in VR as well. So that's one, one nice result from Luduma. Uh, so here's kind of our final result of our source finding so far. We've got about 238 emission line sources. We're not going to say H1 sources because we're not sure which of them are OH and which of them are um, H1 at this moment. But you can see here in the background in the black and the white is the SOFIA moment mask. So anywhere that you've got a black dot um, or black smudge, that's uh, an object that this SOFIA automated code found. And there's... Uh, the, the purple boxes are from Ed's match filter. 
um, code. And then we have in the blue are visually detected sources. So you can see that there's quite good agreement between most of them. These red ones out here are what we've looked at and we think they, these are, so Sophia found these sources, but we think that they are not real. They don't have optical counterparts to them. Um, and then here you can see a Venn diagram showing the overlap between uh, the match filtering, the visual source finding, and Sophia. Um, so this is based on just a simple 30 arc second cross match. Um, and if we consider the visual catalog to be um, the real catalog of sources, then we Sophia is 94% complete and about 80% reliable, which is quite, which is really quite remarkable. Um, and then what, what Leia does is pass this catalog through um, SIP, which is the Sophia Imaging Pipeline written by Kelly Hess, which allows us to compare the H1 contours with the optical images which are in the background. And then it produces these whole lot of other diagnostic plots, which are really nice. Um, and we can run that all uh, Sophia detected sources. Um, but here I'm just going to show you a, an, an array of pretty pics that we found. So H1 detections that were found um, in Laduma by Sophia and their uh, optical counterparts in the background. Um, we found a whole bunch of very low surface brightness or very, very faint optical counterparts to some of these H1 detections as well, emission line detections. We found some weird ones here, which there is these elongated H1 uh, detections, but no uh, optical counterparts. So could these be dark galaxies? Could these be just extremely optically faint? Or could they actually be extended H1 tail? Here is an example of an extended, of, of, a, of a weird shaped uh, detection by Sophia. Um, and you might think that's a false detection. However, this one over here is a different Sophia detection. So you can see if I lay them like that, you can see that this is actually an H1 tail of these interacting galaxies, which is quite neat. And we have found a whole bunch of different interacting systems. So Layer at the moment is going through um, the potential H1 tails to see which of those could be real and which, which could not. So the next steps is to try and do source binding on the UHF band data cube, which is a lot more difficult, um, because partially because we have this booming big Forjansky source in the corner of our field, which gives even more trouble at lower uh, frequencies. So that's an ongoing uh, headache. Um, all right, so then now we're going to move on to MITEI, the MITEI survey. Um, so MITEI stands for the Meerkat International Gigahertz Tiered Extragalactic Exploration Survey. Uh, this is one of the LSPs. It's, it's, all, it's a galaxy evolution survey, so really concerned with everything to do with galaxy evolution. Um, this has 20 times the field of view of uh, Laduma, so this is 20 square degrees, over four different fields, XMM, LSS, ECDFS, Alea South 1, and Cosmos. And you may notice that the, Alea, uh, the ECDFS is the same field as Laduma, so the only the H1 data in this three belongs to Laduma, and the continuum belongs to MITEI. Um, and MITEI has an H1 emission component, continuum component, and also polarization. Um, so observations in both L-band and S-band. And the science goals is basically everything you can think of to do with galaxy evolution that you can do with H1 or continuum. So studying AGN, studying magnetic fields in galaxies, studying star formation, studying environment, um, et cetera. So the early science data is already public. Um, I think Ian Haywood is, is on and, and he's published a, a paper about this um, of Cosmos and three pointings in the XM field. Oh, yes, here we go. This is the paper um, by Ian. And then we have also an internal DR1 release with a much extended XMM LSS field, extended Cosmos, and also one pointing of the CDFS. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the Laduma field. Okay, so MITEI has both an H1 component and a continuum component, as I've said. So first the H1 component, the working group leads are Natasha Maddox and also Brad Frank, who's uh, here at UCT. And there's an initial paper out by Nat Natasha describing the MITEI H1 um, uh, early science data. Um, so if you think of the wedding cake approach that we were talking about before, MITEI is what we might call a medium deep survey. So 
Um, it covers 20 times the field of view of Laduma, as I said, um, but not out to as high redshift and not quite as a high sensitivity. So maxing out at about uh, redshifts of 0.58. Um, we'll go through this very, very far, but basically um, one thing you can do with early science, which has been released so far, is something called stacking, where you may not directly detect H1 from any of the galaxies in your field, um, but you might know where they are because you've got an optical catalogue, which has positions and redshifts. So what you can do is you can go to your um, your mighty H1 data queue, you can extract out the, um, H the spectrum those positions and redshifts and you'll get it on detection um, but you can do this for many different galaxies and then average the spectra together and as this is called stacking as you average more and more of those essentially your noise should go down as root n uh, until you can see a statistical detection popping out of the noise like this so that's what stacking is um, and my PhD student, Tumelo Manjena, is at the beginning of his PhD project working on um, H1 stacking with the mighty H1 data. Um, and he's trying to look at the H1 content of AGN versus non-AGN. So um, here he's stacking at lower redshifts, the H1 signal of AGN versus well, non-AGN, so essentially star-forming galaxies. And you can see actually we've got quite a nice stack detection in both of those. And then over at higher redshifts, we are not getting a detection of the uh, of the H1 there in AGN, but we are getting a stack detection of the star forming galaxies. So we're trying to see if there's this indicates any evidence of feedback. These are very preliminary results. And Miller is also splitting this AGN population into high excitation radio galaxies or HERGs, low excitation radio galaxies or LERGs but I will pretty much skip over that because that's still very much a work in progress. So the final topic I'll cover before I end um, is talking about some results from Mighty Continuum, in particular the discovery of some giant radio galaxies. So we've talked all about spectral line stuff now, about H1, and now we're going to focus on Continuum, which, as I mentioned, was synchrotron radiation, which can come from star-forming galaxies and or AGN. And we're just going to focus on AGN now. So what is a radio galaxy? It's an AGN with plasma jets of relativistic charged particles, um, which are releasing synchrotron radiation. You can see here is uh, Cygnus A, which is like a poster child of uh, radio galaxies. You've got the core, you've got these very um, tight jets, and then you've got these large lobes at the end with um, these hot spots in them. Uh, but Cygnus is actually quite a small radio galaxy. It's just nearby, which is why we can see it in such stunning detail. Um, but if from end to end, a, ra a radio galaxy has a size of more than 0.7 megaparsecs, so more than 700 kiloparsecs, we call it a giant radio galaxy. So Cygnus A is not one of those. You can see how small it is compared to um, what a typical giant radio galaxy would look like. This one is just slightly smaller than uh, a typical radio galaxy. Cygnus A is down here. Um, wait, sorry, which one? This one, Hercules A, is just smaller than, than a typical GRG. And these four here are the biggest known. Um, Alcyonius is, is the recent detection of the largest GRG ever found, which is enormous. Um, and so what is, it's thought that these GRGs, the, the, the radio galaxies grow, the lobes grow outwards as they age. Um, and so these giant radio galaxies are probably the biggest of the biggest because they're the oldest of the oldest. Um, so their size is probably age related, which means that their host galaxies could potentially have been undergoing um, feedback, AGN feedback for the longest amount of time. And therefore we want to study um, the effects of this on the host galaxy. So we want to understand more about GRGs, but um, they are not very um, well studied because until very recently, not many had been found. And now all of a sudden, uh, a few thousand have been found. And you can see the positions um, on the sky of those, mostly found with uh, the LOFAR telescope. Um, and so um, the sky the known sky density of these GRGs is, is increasing very rapidly over, in, over only in the last five years or so. Before that, only a few hundred known. Um, so here is a uh, the mighty cosmos 
um, image. And there are two GRGs hiding in here. One you can see is over here and the other you can see is over here. And these, is, these are what we published in um, our 2021 paper. And shout out to Ian and also Matt Prescott, who actually were the people who spotted those GRGs in the first place. Um, so having a closer look at these, here is one, what I creatively call GRG1. Here's the core. We've got these jets, these lobes, and uh, two hot, hot spots over here. And this is GRG2. Again, the core, some jets. The one is less well detected and some lobes and one hot spot. So based on their angular size and their redshifts of 0.166 and 0.336, you can see that these are both really big GRGs of sizes about two megaparsecs. Remember, it only has to be above 0.7 megaparsecs to class as a GRG. And these are interesting because they were undetected with some very sensitive data taken in this cosmos field by the VLA telescope um, at similar frequencies. So you can see here the contours are showing the, uh, mighty, uh, the mighty data with Meerkat and the grayscale in the background is showing the VLA data. So zooming in on the core, you can see that the VLA detects the very inner parts of the jets, but none of these large scale jets or lobes. Um, and this is basically because uh, Meerkat has an excellent surface brightness sensitivity that the VLA can't quite achieve. Um, and so this should show you, yeah, flicking between the mighty cosmos observation. So that's the lowest resolution one. Then the VLA observations, which have been smoothed to match the resolution of mighty, and then the very full resolution. And you can see the lobes detected in mighty and then not in VLA or not in the high resolution VLA in both cases. Okay. So I'm going to skip through most of this just for the sake of time, but if you do a little bit of st statistic here, you realize that it's quite surprising for us to have found two GRGs of such large sizes within just a one square degree field. And this implies that um, GRG sky density is actually a lot, a lot higher than what we previously assumed. Um, and this is now being uh, confirmed with other surveys, for example, with LOFAR. Um, and our, I say our, the, the mighty GRGs are kind of special because they sit in this unique part of parameter space. So this is what we call the PD diagram, where we have um, the size of the radio galaxy. So bigger is over here, and this is the radio power. So the fainter lower power sources are down here. Um, and we, I'm only plotting known GRGs on this plot. Radio galaxies would populate this part, but I'm not showing them because I'm not interested in them right now. You can see this is the position of GRG1 and GRG2 on this plot. Um, so immediately you can see that they are larger than most other GRGs. So they're out here in the large sizes, but they're kind of lower power. So they sit in this kind of previously unoccupied, mostly unoccupied part of parameter space, um, which is below the sensitivity limit of, of the LOTS survey. Um, and basically we're probing down here because this MITEI survey has uh, an improved um, sensitivity, point source sensitivity compared to LOTS. Um, and so MITEI is probing a new part of galaxy evolution parameter space, which is quite exciting. Um, and then finally, just to end up, I wanted to show you some follow-up observations that we are taking of these GRGs using MITEI. So we used some uh, open time. We were ordered uh, eight hours to observe the cosmos field with the UHF band. Um, so here you can see that image that the data was reduced by Ian Hayward. And this is a single pointing um, of the cosmos field. We reach a thermal noise of about four microjansky per beam, uh, 15 arc second resolution. Um, you can see GRG1 and GRG2 are detected there. And I'm flicking between the two, the between the UHF band and the L band in each case. So the lower resolution one is the UHF band, and you can see that both GRGs are nicely detected um, in that. But you can also see that there's a third one up top here. So this is GRG3, um, which again, you can, I'm flicking between the L band and the UF band, and you can see that's clearly, clearly detected there. Um, so GRG3 sits at a shift of 0.1, and that gives it a size of 1.3 megaparsecs. Um, and this is the optical image. I'm just overlaying it there. 
Um, it's what we call a LERG, so a low excitation radio galaxy. It doesn't have any evidence of AGN activity at any other wavelength. Um, no emission lines. You can see this is the optical spectrum. No emission lines are seen, only some absorption lines. And that's also the case for GRG, GRGs 1 and 2, hosted by these large red and dead elliptical galaxies. Um, I'll also flash up that um, the honour work of, Kath of, of our student Kathleen Charlton was to um, basically take the, the L-band map of each of these GRGs, take the um, HF band map, find the ratio between them, and that gives you what is called a spectral index map. So Kathleen studied these in detail. She derived um, the, spec the ages of the electrons, the spectral ages, uh, the spectral age maps, um, and produced some of the first uh, spatial resolved spectral index and, and age maps of GRGs. Uh, we have found one other paper that was published on this for, for GRG, but this was from a few years ago. Um, and the idea of this is to better understand the physical nature and duty cycle of, of GRGs. And so Kathleen's preparing a paper on that right now. If you want to know more about that, you can ask me in question time. So I've got a few extra slides on that. Um, the final thing I'll say is that um, I'm running a, I'm, um, I've proposed a master's project to uh, search the other mighty fields for GRGs. So hopefully we get a student to take that up. Um, and here are just two other GRGs found in other mighty fields, just by eye. Um, but we wanted to take a more systemic um, approach to doing that, which will require cross-matching in, in the optical, um, optical catalogs. So you can see that here's the optical image in the background. I think this is HSC. Um, I could be wrong about that, um, but you can see these two interacting galaxies uh, with these nice big H1 contours here, which is really nice. Okay, so I will end there. I think I'm on time. Um, so just to summarize, we've talked about how Meerkat is a really excellent vessel for galaxy evolution surveys. Uh, we talked about the Laduma survey, which is narrow, which is a narrow deep H1 survey of the ECDFS field. The DAR1 is nearly ready, and we found more than 130 sources in the field. Then we have the MITI survey, which is uh, has both a radio continuum and an H1 component. It extends over 20 square degrees. And with that data, we found three giant radio galaxies, um, at least two of which had been completely resolved out of the VLA data. Um, and this suggests a significantly higher GRG sky density than was previously known. And this is now already being supported by other recent studies with the SKA Pathfinders. Um, we've shown that we're probing a new part of GRG parameter space, low power and extended. And so this is providing new insights into the AGN duty cycle, or hopefully will provide new insights. Um, we've been able to produce some of the first spatially resolved spectral index maps of GRGs. Um, and further searches for further GRGs are underway. And all in all, this demonstrates the excellent surface brightness sensitivity of Meerkat um, and the potential for the MITI and the Luduma surveys to detect unique objects and become legacy galaxy evolution surveys. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, okay. Hello, uh, Jacinta. Um, yes. Uh, yes. Thank you uh, again. Thanks for uh, for your very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, maybe we can have uh, some questions from the uh, participants. Uh, oh, somebody does have a question? No. Otherwise, I have one. So um, in the... Am I audible? Yes. Oh. Hello. Yes, well, my question is, in, in the dark galaxies that you show at the, begin, um, at the beginning, when you have only the, uh, the H1 detection, those deep sources, uh, uh, I guess they are optically uh, faint in the optical, but do they have a, a IRAC detections or Hersey detections, or have you taken a look at, to the other uh, data at other wavelengths? to know more about their nature? Yes, yeah, so I think talking about these ones here, the optically dark galaxies. Um, yes, so Leia has been looking at these um, in Wise 
and so far has not done any detections. Um, so we're having a look at a few other wavelengths as well. Um, we want to specifically look at these in VR to, to, in order to find out whether these might be H1 tails um, associated with other Sophia sources, which are a bit further away. Um, but yeah, as far as we know, we haven't found any any counterparts to these yet. It could, of course, just be low, they are low signal to noise sources, so they could just be peaks in noise, um, but we will get into that in more detail. Uh, okay, thanks. So maybe another questions, no? I can uh, see Yin Zema has a question. Hello, yes. yes. Am I audible? Hello? Yes. yes, we can hear you. Okay. Hello. Hi, Jacinda. Yeah, very nice talk. Nice talk. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I wonder, uh, for your current uh, cross-match with La Duma, you use uh, Sophia and others, and how many cross-match galaxies that you have found? La Duma? Uh, so we yeah. found about 238 altogether. Oh, okay. Well, they, are these mostly optical counterpart or optical and infrared? And uh, what is the multivalence survey? That uh, you sorry, was your, was your question about the H1 or about the multivalence? Uh, the multivalence. Ah, okay. Um, okay, so we haven't looked in detail yet. Most of these do have optical detections, um, except for a few of these sources over here, which are Sophia only, which is kind of these kind of sources that, that I was showing you earlier. Um, so as we said, we're looking at, we've also looked at WISE and we haven't found any detections in there. Um, and we're in the process of looking at other wavelengths. Um, and then for spectroscopic relatives, we are also in the process of cross-matching there. Um, about 151 of them have definite cross matches at the moment and we're going through that and, and being more careful and, and finding more of those now. Okay, yes, that's that's good. And I have other questions. Maybe uh, I will be after other people. So like other people to raise. Okay, another question, no? Someone? So I have another one. So if you have the, um, uh, what, have you taken a look to the environments of these uh, giant radio galaxies? If they are maybe in cluster, uh, in galaxy clusters, or they are isolated? No. They're in small groups, very small groups, and we've also looked at the X rays and haven't found any detections there. Um, but we're trying to use the X rays at least upper limits to constrain the. Um, at the moment, we're just assuming equipartition when we create the spectral age maps. And so we're trying to use the X-ray data to get more information there. Um, but yeah, as far as we know, they are fairly normal, low excitation radio galaxies in relatively underpopulated areas. Okay, and have you found a, a signatures of positive uh, aging feedback because of the jets? Uh, no, uh, no that there doesn't seem to be much gas in the system um and so i guess yeah as i said these these look like red and dead elliptical galaxies where most of the cold gas at least has already been either heated up or blown out uh, which you would expect from these late stages of galaxy evolution so um, we haven't found any evidence of positive feedback at the moment um but i would be interested in, to, in hearing we might be able to do that Okay, thanks. 